It's the My Michelle Live podcast. My Michelle Live, Psy Tech Talk, taking the God story to a geeky place. Here's Michelle. Hey, thank you for joining in today. This is what we call Psy Tech Talk. And in our Psy Tech Talk today, oh, such important things like, well, you. I mean, after all, we can talk about the origins of the universe, the origins of life. But what about the origins of you? And why do those origins matter? Where you turn on the evening news, you listen to the stories of the day, you're on Facebook debating the things so close to you. But did you think for one moment that the very things that you're talking about are affected? by the science of the origins of you. Absolutely. And we're going to find out why with Dr. Fazrana from Reasons to Believe. They are an organization that looks into science. Uh, they publish on their page dozens upon dozens of tantalizing, interesting, intriguing uh, blog postings and papers that you can peruse through to titillate your mind and think harder about what's going on in the world of science and how we see more and more how science reveals intelligent design and who that intelligent designer might be. And if that's the case, is there science that can show a little bit more about our origins? We'll find it out with Dr. Fuzz Rana. Dr. Rana, thanks for joining us. Michelle, thanks for having me. It's always fun to hang out. It's always fun to hang out with you. You are, I mean, you are one of the people who blow the top off of the idea that scientists are just geeky. You know, you, you can't be fun to, oh yeah, you are. And this conversation is going to be interesting, folks, as we look at what's going on in the news. Now look, the cosmos, the Big Bang, the universe fuzz, these are all things that we can talk about on a regular basis. We look at so much programming, mathematics, equations, intricacies, diversity, and every freaking molecule of the universe, including all the molecules that make up Dr. Fuzz Rana. So as we look at origins and we think, if we put two and two together and we look at origins and we look at what's going on in the world, can we come up with uh, an equation for what the heck is going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I think when it comes to questions of origins, particularly questions of, about the origin of humanity, people might be interested in, you know, how do we explain where human beings come from? Because after all, we're, we're kind of interested in, in our own story. Always you know, interested in, in our own story. I mean, right. come on. That's the only story that matters. That's why we're talking about you today. That's why you're tuning in. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it's not just about us as individuals, but really it's about our species. You know, what is really, you know, where is it that we came from? But many times up at that point and just see this as really of, of academic interest. They don't really, I think, draw the connection between the fact that what we think about where we come from as a species, uh, who are we really as human beings is deeply connected to our, our origin story. And that in turn, has implications for how we live our lives and hence what is happening, you know, in the world around us today. And so many of the, I think the, the issues that are most important to us ultimately uh, really arise out of how we think about ourselves as, as human beings. Something we get to in every My Michelle Live, asking that question about your worldview. And it doesn't matter if you're joining us for SciTech Tuesday or Health Watch Wednesday, if we're talking news and views, sports, or entertainment it doesn't matter. Your worldview matters in how you look at the world, how you interact with others, and as a society, fuzz, our worldview affects everything from the violence in Chicago to how we interact with mask mandates. I mean, all of these things are literally affected by our worldview. And our worldview 
if you were to deconstruct it, really does come down to our views on origins. Yeah, and and really in in our world today, there are two prominent views that people have of where we come from as human beings. One of them is a view that really has been shaped uh, by the scientific community at large, and, and it really traces its origin back to uh, Darwin's work, The Descent of Man. But this is a, a perspective that says, well, human beings are the product of an evolutionary history. And, and many people won't even think much beyond that other than, hey, yeah, we evolved like, like other creatures. But the implications of that idea are really, in my view, pretty profound. Because if indeed we are the product of evolution, it means that everything about us as human beings that we think is special or makes us exceptional uh, is actually something that emerged through unguided, undirected processes, where we're just a lucky happenstance of an, of an evolutionary history. And we're no different than any other creature that exists. There's no inherent value or worth in human beings, more so than there would be in, in any other creature. And there's really no ultimate meaning or purpose for, for our existence if we just, again, are the product of evolution. The late uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who was a, an evolutionary biologist, uh, uh, had this concept that was very helpful here. And he said, if you could rewind the tape of life and let evolution take place again, the outcome would be different every time because of the unguided, contingent nature of evolution, meaning that re probably human beings wouldn't have existed. If we could rewind the tape of life and let evolution play itself out, we wouldn't have even existed. And so that view really strips people of ultimately value and worth and, and meaning and purpose. And so I think when we, we, this view, which has shaped how many people think about our origins, really has implications. Because what difference does it make then if we are going to abort a, a, a baby, an unborn baby, uh, if indeed we're just the product of evolution, if we really are no different than any other creature? That's a very good nothing. point. And I'm intrigued by the idea that if you were to rewind time and roll the dice again for the universe and how everything played out every time you'd roll the dice it would be a different outcome when you wrap your head around that i mentioned before the intricacies of life the absolute crazy chance off chance that we happened to have a universe perfectly suited for life on one planet if we roll the dice and we see the chances of i mean i'm going to vegas later today for the league's cup i guess if we were to really be scientifically accurate i could take a penny and walk out with all the wealth in the world fuzz when does it become mathematically impossible i mean mathematically impossible for michelle to walk into any given casino put uh, a penny down and instantly walk away with all of the accumulative wealth in the world because i would say and you can correct me if i'm wrong as a scientist that is about the equation of the chances of life that we know it on this planet just being by chance. Yeah, well, you're, you're bringing up a, a really important point here. And that is, you know, even that's though, what I do again. Yeah, <laughs> you know, even though, uh, you know, the, the, the scientific community really looks at human beings as just a lucky happenstance. When we really look at what the science is telling us, it's telling us, I think, a, a very different story. You know, we, okay. you talk, uh, talked earlier about the origin of the universe. Well, something, you know, connected to that idea is that the universe appears to be exquisitely designed so that life is possible. And we see this in, in what's called the fine tuning of the constants of physics, where if any of those values that define the universe vary ever uh, so slightly, in some instances, practically imperceptibly, life simply couldn't even exist. And as the late Freeman Dyson once said, uh, he was a, a physicist, it's almost as if the universe had us in mind. That is, it almost looks like the universe is structured so that human life is actually possible. And even when we look at the Earth, again, it looks as if the, the, the design of the Earth is such that 
again, that the earth had us in mind, so to speak, that the earth seems to be structured in such a way that not only could humans exist, but that advanced human civilizations are possible. And, and so this is really a pointer to the fact that in spite of this scientific perspective that human life has meaning is meaningless, there's other indications that suggest maybe there is a fundamental purpose to the universe, and that fundamental purpose really is pointing to, to our, our advent and our existence mm -hmm. as, as human beings. And, so the and universe, course, we, we think that the universe is purposeless, and in that void, an outpouring of news stories that kind of line up with that when you have no purpose when there is really no rhyme or reason and you have no value for life haven't we become kind of a a, a hypocrisy a, a dichotomy we need to make decisions because people's lives matter but on the other hand life doesn't matter so i want to take this down from the universe to an individual level uh, one of the strictest abortion bans in the entire nation went into effect at the beginning of September. And this is uh, coming from Texas. So I'm sure you've heard of Senate Bill 8, SB 8, signed into law by Governor Greg Abbott, empowers private individuals to sue anyone who performs an abortion after the six-week sixth week of pregnancy. There's only three news stories in the entire nation. One's a missing woman. The other is mandates. And then this one, there's only three things going on in the world. So if you haven't heard of it, you're hearing about it now. Anyone who knowingly engages that aids or abets the performance of or inducement of an abortion. So in light of that, we're seeing a renewed debate over abortion, abortion laws, the idea that my body, my choice, and then that breaks down when it comes over here to vaccines, for example. <laughs> when is it your choice? When is it not? When is it your body? When, what is the value of human life? This is why our worldview does matter, because on one end, uh, you have people saying this is draconian. This is going to lead to backstreet ab alley abortions. It really should be my body, my choice, because my life matters. On um, but a an unborn child's life, we don't know. You know, is it really an unborn? Is it really a child? And when is it? Does it become life? You know, you're you're making you know just a succession of very good points today, Michelle. Not that you don't do that every time that we, we talk, but, <laughs> but, you know, you're but, just you surprised know, because we're, we're world doing world. this early in the morning and it's like, wow, she's now a morning person and she's almost making sense. This is awesome. This might be good today. <laughs> uh, but, you know, this idea of, of, of a worldview is really very important and we really need to spend the time making sure we understand what our worldview actually is. You know, and because it's a fundamental set of beliefs about how the world is, and and we interpret the world through that lens. But if we don't have a, a, a good understanding of our worldview, it leads to really inconsistency. And so what you, you see happening is the message from science is, hey, human life really doesn't matter. It doesn't have ultimate meaning or purpose. There's nothing exceptional about us as human beings. But yet in our heart of hearts, we know that human life does have value. And, and, and so we see this struggle that people have between, you know, rejecting the idea that human life is, is valuable and recognizing that human life is valuable because of that internal compass, I believe, that, that many people have where we intuitively recognize that human life is of worth, or we try to create some kind of local meaning, or we try to to, you know, we become very self-centered in terms of how we think about value, where what's, what impacts me is valuable and what impacts you is less valuable to me. And so it becomes a power struggle over who gets to determine what is or isn't, you know, considered to be valuable or what human life has worth and, and meaning. And this is where I think the Christian worldview really becomes very important because the Christian worldview basically says human beings are exceptional, that we are we stand apart from all other creatures. We're the, the crown of creation, to use biblical language. 
uh, and that we, we bear the image of God. And that's what gives us our meaning and worth and value. And, and because of that, that, not only do we as individuals have purpose and meaning and value because we matter to the creator who made us to be in a relationship with him, but other people who bear God's image have value as well. And, and, and this is an insight that lines up with what we're seeing in the sciences. It, it, it's consistent with the idea that there's design in the universe, that the earth appears to be designed so that human life can exist and that human civilization is possible. It suggests a, a purpose that, that lines up with that, the Christian worldview. But so too does this idea that, that a number of anthropologists are recognizing now that human beings really are exceptional, that, that we st- seem to stand apart from all other creatures okay. in, in ways that, that, that are consistent with what we would understand to be the image of God. And so what's encouraging to me is that the science is lining up with the Christian worldview. It's buttressing the Christian worldview. And I think if we embrace the Christian worldview, it allows us to, to live a much more consistent life where we, we are able to then recognize the value in other people. And I su- su- would submit to you that many of the social issues we're struggling with right now would evaporate if mm-hmm. this perspective was much more widespreadly w- adopted much more in a widespread manner in our culture. I see. So your worldview matters. And I want to talk about uh, origins. Some of the statements that you made are fabulous, but I want to get into some of the science of it. And we can do that if you're kind of new to My Michelle Live. Dr. Rana is a frequent flyer in this party. And uh To give you some background, Dr. Rana is, as I may have mentioned, vice president at Reasons to Believe of Research and Apologetics. He is a microbiologist. He has an extraordinary background that I could take half the show talking about. He's the author of many, many books. And I, I say this a lot when you're on. I got to sit under you giving a, a talk to fellow scientists and it was so fascinating. I was I was probably two paragraphs behind trying to catch up. I mean, there are some really deep, intricate, interesting, mind-blowing things going on in the scientific realm where biology is concerned, where oh, even it ties into our origins. And so I want to talk about some of that science that leads credence to the value of human life. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, to, to me, uh, and there's a number of ways we can we can go at this, but you know, to me, as as somebody who is a you know a, a molecular life scientist, you know, who who deals with kind of the intricacies of the cell, brings a, a, a zygote, uh, you know, that results from the fertilization of a of an egg in a sperm cell. That to me is the point in which human life begins and it's the point where i think a human person uh actually begins as well wait wait wait! Uh, that's a huge statement how how do you know that how do you come to that conclusion as a scientist i mean it's a couple of cells coming together what yeah well because the 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 that that zygote that fertilized egg is is an entity that is unique uh, it is clearly, a, a, you know, genetically speaking, it, it is clearly a unique human individual at that point in time. But the, the zygote is a special type of cell that imbued within it is this potential to develop into a, a fully formed uh, human being, a fully developed human being. And there's not any other cell that exists that, that you know, any other human cell, I should say, there's 210 different cell types that are part of our, our body. No other cell has that, that kind of developmental potential. And, and so to me, it's not only the fact that it's genetically speaking a unique individual, but it's that developmental potential that it has to become a fully formed human being. At any point in time that you would draw a line and say, well, at this point, it's not a human person. And at that point, following that, it is a human person is strictly speaking arbitrary. There's no, there's no scientific basis for any kind of line drawn in the sand. So 
you have people at the most extreme, like Peter Singer, uh, who uh, is a, a bioethicist at Princeton University. He's an atheist, and he's considered to be one of the leading utilitarian thinkers in the world today. And his view is that that sentience, self-awareness, is actually mm. the, the quality that makes a, an entity a person. And he argues that, technically speaking, you could actually commit infanticide up to two years of age because up to that point, that, that child doesn't have self-awareness. It, it's, it's, it's not a sentient individual. Well, wouldn't and, that, and I, uh, can, can I just intervene here and ask, wouldn't that extend to uh, people who's, who uh, are not necessarily self-aware because they have uh, right. some kind of mental incapacity? Um, would that happen like every Friday night at the bar down the street when people aren't self-aware? I mean, where, where do you draw the line there? Well, exactly. And again, you know, a very good point, because this justifies, you know, Peter Singer is actually in favor of terminating uh, the lives of individuals that suffer from severe disabilities, because he argues that this is, they are living a life of undue pain and misery, or it justifies, again, euthanasia. It, you know, that's really that interesting are... when you think of, about that, because there have been many very famous disabled people who, without the aid of electronic computer type driven devices, we would think that they were just sitting, you know, in the corner, unable to interact with the world. And yet inside is brilliance. And y you see that we've seen that with a lot of people, some very famous and some that we may will never meet that people who are on the spectrum who seem to have no uh, self awareness, and suddenly by interacting with computers, you can hear their beautiful voices. You can hear their interactive mind. So it, it, it's it this that statement. While I'm nowhere near the brilliance, I would still challenge it and say that is one of the most arrogant statements I have ever heard. Because you know, obviously, he makes the cut. Where do the rest of us fall? And and then yeah. wh where wh can you change that to say, well, if you're sentient and yet you're not uh, woke, when do we make it a po political issue? Because everything's political yeah. these well, days. Well, you know, it, know, and part of the problem, part of the problem I have is I don't even know how to truly define what sentience is. I mean, this is a real scientific struggle. Nobody can really define what it is, or how do I measure it? How do I know? that s someone is truly sentient or not, you know, and, you know, if, if, if you're two weeks before the cutoff point, are you somehow not a person, but two weeks later you are? It's, it's, it's strictly and speaking. who's to say that a two-year-old or a one-year-old isn't sentient or aware just on a fundamental basic level? That just sounds like, I, I guess I get back to arrogance. We know right. all. We have it all figured out. We've got this. We've got all the science. There's nothing more to be learned. Just believe what we say. And this is what we now believe that, I mean, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. I understand though. I, I don't mean to just be dismissive, Dr. Ron. I understand that they're trying to say that a child or a person or a disabled person, you know, they, they're not as aware as we are, but it just sounds, I don't know. I'm trying to make excuses and be balanced, right. but it just sounds arrogant. Well, <laughs> I'm not know, doing but, my but job this today. Is, this is the uh, outworking of essentially an evolutionary perspective. Worldview. Boom. Exactly. Because again, if, if you don't think human beings have inherent worth and value, if, if you, you think we're no different than any other creature, then you can come in as a person that is in power and you can put in place these arbitrary you know, sets of delineators as to when somebody should be afforded human rights and when somebody shouldn't. But if you take a Christian worldview where you say every human being bears God's image, every human being has intrinsic worth and value, then suddenly dignity is afforded to every human being regardless of functionality or capability, because they are image bearers, they have inherent worth and value. Or if you, you know, you think about this idea that, you know, that the psalmist writes about that you, you, you knit me together in my mother's womb, or 
that I'm, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, that even at the very beginning of our existence as, individual, God, as individuals, God is there, you know, essentially present, giving incredible worth and value, interacting with us at, mm. at the very point that, that, that our lives begin. And so this view is going to place a very high value on human life. In, in a very high, you know, dignity to individuals who, who no longer are capable of functioning, but it's also going to, you know, really afford pr- protection to, you know, to the unborn. And, and, it's and, fascinating you know, so, how that works. When you walk through it and you look at these two worldviews that we presented, you're talking about right now, Fuzz, a worldview of the veneration of life the appreciation of life there's a beauty to that there's a preciousness every life is precious every life matters and yeah it matters once they've been born too you know that's one of the big arguments is for people who are uh, anti-abortion where do you care afterwards well if they don't then yeah their wor- their worldview is being messed up too they're not being consistent i get it i'm with you on that but there's a preciousness on on the other hand you have this disregard for human life. I mean, can you imagine taking, and it's happened a few times before in history, even in biblical history, taking all the kids under under the age of two and just uh, putting them to death. It's happened before on wide scale. You know, it's, it's as though there's nothing new under the sun and we're just saying, yeah, that's fine. Whatever. They're not sentient. They're not real people. It doesn't matter. Take that suckling baby from a mama and say that life doesn't matter. That life doesn't have meaning. Uh, you just see the breakdown. No wonder we can easily kill each other. We can talk to each other like, like w- with such disdain and hate on social media. I mean, it just continues to to be an yeah. outpouring of our worldviews. Yeah, and that's a very very strong point. And you know, this is I, I'm going to say something that's going to be a little controversial as somebody who holds to a pro life perspective. But, uh, you know, on one hand, I'm thrilled to death with the, the, the abortion legislation in Texas that has been enacted, you know, and I'm thrilled that the Supreme mm-hmm. Court, you know, on, on a five to four vote refused to, to, to block the enforcement of the law. So I, I consider that to be a huge victory. And I'm not a legal or political scholar, but, uh, you know, I understand that, you know, there's a genius, a, a legal genius to the way that legislation was crafted. You know, but to me, I, I, I am concerned about that legislation in this sense. I think there's a fundamental flaw in the reasoning uh, behind that legislation uh, scientifically and philosophically because it essentially says that at the point that a heartbeat is detected, you know, abortion can no longer take place. But what you've done is you've said that you, you've created functionality as the delineator for mm-hmm. when that 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 unborn child is actually considered a person, which means prior to six weeks, that that unborn child do, is not afforded protection, right? And it's because we we've used functionality, hmm. you know. And there's already you know, people from a scientific perspective challenging the legislation, saying that technically speaking, at that point in time, it's actually not truly a heartbeat; it's just electrical activity in myocytes that make up the heart tube, it's only several weeks later that you actually have valves and chambers and actually a a rudimentary circulatory system. And then it gets into the debate of when is a heartbeat? When is a heartbeat? A heartbeat. That's, this is, it's kind of nuts. And it's interesting that you say that's your issue with it. I have a completely different issue with it that goes to me, goes back to worldview as well, is the brown shirt. uh, You can, anyone can report it. You know, people looking over the fence and going, oh, I wonder who's having an abortion over there. Uh, You know, that's, that just is, it plays into a mm. disregard or disrespect and and uh, let's turn people in if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, right. That's one of the problems that I have with it. But I think yeah. it opening up this conversation again on abortion is important because you can be 
in favor of choice. I mean, nobody wants to see a woman and, and let's, let's just be honest. There's a lot of people who get abortions and, and go like it's an abortion spa, you know, Oh, I got an abortion. I'm, and then now I'm going to get my nails done. But the vast majority in reality are women who are faced with impossible situations. It, um, heartbreaking circumstances, um, financial devastation and wondering how can I do this? And so I don't want to just take abortion lightly. Um, I don't mind talking about the viability or the, the, uh, value of a couple of cells being, being live. I don't mind talking about that because I find that to be true. But what is also true is the struggle of women, the struggle, uh, in, in our very fallen world, uh, their lives matter too. Your life matters. If you're struggling with this issue, your life definitely matters. But sweetheart, as you're making this choice, if you don't really understand, if you're not given all of the information, if you're not looking at it, in it and saying, okay, this is a human life and I'm willing to take one, then you have to live with those consequences that come back. We've seen in study after study and testimony after testimony, they come back and haunt you in many, many ways. We're not giving you a choice because you're not giving, getting all the information in our society. And that's why this is important too. your life matters. Your life is precious. Your decisions matter too. If you're going to make a choice, have all the information or it's not a choice. It's coercion. It's, um, it's a jumping in and doing something and uh, making a short term solution to a long term issue. So uh, having said that, I'll get off my soapbox and I want to get back into uh, some of the issues surrounding what we do know now about life, because it really does matter. And having a worldview, not just an appreciation for life, but a worldview that says, hey, there is a God and God cares and he has a plan for you matters. Um, Fuzz, this is where we get really personal because this is a really personal issue. So forgive me. We've been friends and we've worked together a long time. So you'll indulge me, I'm sure. But my firstborn child, my son was a product of date rape. And at that point, uh, at, a, at a very young age, that's where people say, you know, this is going to affect me for the rest of my life. I'm going to be cursed with a, a child that I'm going to look at and see a, a violent act. And I want to tell you in my world, in my life, um, I chose his life. And that was the most wonderful thing I've ever done. I've never been more blessed. The most precious, wonderful child, something so beautiful came out of something so heinous. And I had to trust that, that God would help me and protect me and uh, help me. To, I couldn't even keep a plant alive. What the heck am I doing having a baby? Um, and somehow, by the grace of God, he turned out to be uh, my magnum opus, you know, a, a work of art, a, a um, incredible human being. So, um, yeah, I know. I like to get kind of real because what's the point of being a talking head? But I want to tell you, as you're going through issues and you're watching, I've walked that road too. I've had to make that decision myself. Um, and I want to tell you that if your worldview contains a living God who values life and values you, then you know that he's got you. So... Well, you know, I, I appreciate you very much sharing that. That's, wow, that, that's an incredible story of, of really of redemption. And this, again, you know, circles back to this idea we're talking about where, you know, worldview matters and, and our origin story really matters. Because if we as human beings are created in God's image, it means we're created to be in a relationship with God. And yet we live in a world where we are alienated and distant from God, we're alienated and distant from one another. And it's because of, of sin, because as human beings, our tendency is to rebel against God. And yet this is the, the, the beauty of the gospel is, 
even when we were, you know, uh, at odds with God, God was still reaching out to us and, and offering us hope and salvation, you know, through the, the person of Christ and the sacrifice on the cross. But then I think a, a, a part of the gospel that we tend to, to overlook is the, the, the redemptive power of God. You know, not only are we redeemed out of our sin, but the worst circumstances in our lives, God can use and redeem them and out of what was a horrendous act of evil, unbelievable good can come. And, you know, and, and this is the thing that, that amazes me time and time again is stories like yours, you know, where it, it's just like the, the, out of the darkest point in a person's life, that not only is there a glimmer of hope, but that there's this incredible flood of, of, of sunlight into the situation from God. And what, you know, again, was was evil was dark god turns into something of incredible beauty and and that's the power of the gospel and that i think is what people are are losing out of when they in, embrace a, a worldview that that really denigrates and undermines human worth and value how interesting we started out with talking about society and how society is losing out because of our collective worldview society is missing out on the value of life and we see it played out um, in every news story and battled out because I think we have a sense of what life really is inside of us. I think we really do. And that's why uh, we, we care so much on one end and then we seem to not, you know, it, it breaks down because of our worldview. So we talked about it on a big scale and now you're saying, you know what, it really matters in your individual life, in your individual circumstance, where you are right now, what you're struggling with, what seems overwhelming, what is the burden of your heart, or even the guilt of uh, decisions you've made in the past. All of those things are um, changed at the foot of the cross. That's pretty powerful. And here, you know, that's, that's fundamental. It's theological. It's um, empowering. But this is a science show. So, <laughs> so it's amazing how science can lead to conclusions like this. Well, you know, the, the, the God who is the creator is also the God who is the redeemer. And so in many respects, you know, I would think that, that not only should science reveal God's fingerprints to us, but when we look at the way the world works. I, I think there's even redemptive analogies within the creation. But so this idea of God, the creator and the redeemer is, is inseparable. And so science should lead us ultimately to the foot of the cross. Well, th I, that's where we're at right now, the foot of the cross. Um, even as we're talking science, uh, the, the origins of the world, the origins of you your worldview matters. A worldview without God, if there really is a God, a worldview without God breaks down really, really quickly. So much so that you need to shut out other information and not let it challenge your worldview because otherwise you're going to be faced with one that breaks down. But if you come to a place where you're brave and you say, you know what, let's investigate it for no other reason, just to prove it wrong, bring it. God says, come let us reason together. He's not afraid of the challenge. Bring that challenge. Investigate it for yourself. See if what we're saying is real, is true, and how that works in your situation, in your circumstance, in your worldview, and how that plays out in the world around you. It's worth investigating. And to give you some aid, to give you some help, I would suggest going to reasons.org. There are a lot of fascinating articles. There's many things you can learn. There's a lot of things that I go, yeah, there's things I go, oh know about that but that's where you're allowed to ask those questions incredible books i i have not read a book that has the last name rana on it <laughs> and the first the first part dr fuzz uh dr fuzzle rana um that i haven't been just uh, fascinated by taking science to a whole new level 
a spiritual level. It's pretty exciting. So, Dr. Rana, thank you very much once again for joining us. Thanks for all that you do there at reasons.org. Go buy some books, uh, look up some articles, and I hope we get to talk with you again soon. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me, Michelle. It's always fun. More SciTech Talk at MyMichelleLive.com.